It's been forever since I covered a Ralph Bakshi movie. While I could redo the one I did before, since I did a poor job that time, I think I'll just try my hand at a movie I've seen from him before. For now, I'm gonna do the one that's fascinating in all sorts of ways. It's the 1992 movie, Cool World. so cool about Cool World? It's complicated. The movie came about after Bakshi's career made a comeback with Mighty Mouse The New Adventures, and when he pitched the plot of Cool World to Paramount Pictures, he got the green light very quickly. He would work on the screenplay with Michael Gross, Mark Victor, and Larry Gross, and when producer Frank Mancuso Jr. tried to change the story on his own, Bakshi allegedly punched him in the face! which was something he denied in a 2022 interview. Now, I can get into the marketing strategy for this film, but that requires meeting a certain character. For now, let us enter Cool World and see if it lives up to its name. We open in 1945 with the return of some World War II veterans, including one of our main characters, Frank, played by Brad Pitt. He's reunited with his mother and shows her a lovely red motorcycle he brought home. I'm sure nothing bad will happen to these two. Oh boy! War drama ensues, then Frank finds his mother... dead. And suddenly we have a cartoon character! Whoever he is, he decides to get Frank over to his world. This man's not dangerous to anyone. As for us, son, we may not be real to you as yet. <laughs> but we will be. Like, hardly any build-up to this. With Roger Rabbit, the reveal of the Toon World is a twist on how cartoons were being filmed. While with Space Jam, we saw that Toons might have existed in space before showing another world under a golf course. Here, Frank gets into a crash and without warning, here's a cartoon doctor. The possibility of interworld travel has been an obsession of mine for many, many years. And the effect work is on the mixed side. But we'll see more of that later. Before we continue, I'd like to point out that Frank is not the main character of this story. It would make sense he would, but we skip ahead 47 years later to see the actual protagonist, Jack Deebs, played by Gabriel Bryan. He's a jailed cartoonist who's about to finish his sentence, and he's apparently allowed to draw while in prison. He is obsessed with his drawing of a woman named Holly because he needs to stay sane in the big house somehow. Come to me. I know we established the existence of Cool World earlier, but could we wait until after we learn more about this guy? But now that we're in the animated part, I'm gonna just say this. I freaking love the way Cool World looks. Cool World's design is based on paintings by Barry Jackson. They have this twisted nightmare feel that really invokes the dark tone this movie has. Granted, it would fit in more with Bakshi's original vision of having this be a horror film, but instead we have a black comedy. Oh, and remember how obsessed Jack is about Holly? This is Holly Wood voiced by Kim Basinger. She is allegedly a creation of Jack and the center of attention for those who frequent her nightclub. Those tunes mostly resemble those from Terry Tunes and Flesher Studios, but we also have still paintings of patrons who don't really gel with the rest of the animated cast. At least they look good though. For now, Jack is trying to reach out for Holly, only to be booted back to reality. Guess it was a half dream? We then meet another criminal named Sparks, voiced by Michael Lally, who seems rather cool looking, and he even has killer wooden coins. <laughs> Of course, it seems like everyone in this city is a criminal, since they're just beating up one another on screen. 
Apparently, the animators were never given a screenplay, and they were just told to add in what they thought was funny. This leads to a lot of cartoon characters who feel completely random without actually telling a story. Oh yeah, that's another thing. While Cool World might look like a painting a lot of the time, the backgrounds become a real set whenever human characters show up. Sometimes they apply cell shading or whatever they have to replicate that artistic feel, but it doesn't always work. It's like a knockoff Roger Rabbit and Space Jam, especially with the cutout props. Oh hey, Frank is here, and he hasn't aged a day in almost 50 years. He's here with Holly, and what does she want out of life? This is an exact replica of the dress Marilyn Monroe wore in Let's Make Love. The girl gets everything by the end of it. Everything she ever wanted. She's a regular femme fatale, it seems. More so than Jessica Rabbit, given this story. You can probably imagine how much Bakshi wanted to use her in marketing, as they even erected a 75-foot sign of her on the Hollywood sign. But Paramount wanted to tone down the adult content for younger audiences and to make Cool World a PG-13 film rather than a hard R. I guess it pigeonholed animation as a kid's medium, even if it can work for any audience. By the way, thanks to that one character named Dr. Whiskers, voiced by Maurice LaMarche, Frank has become a detective in Cool World. Honestly, it could have been pretty cool if there was a mystery in this cartoon world with a human detective at its center, but that would sound too much like Who Framed Roger Rabbit, wouldn't it? Instead, Holly's goal is to reach the real Las Vegas. Maybe she should have asked Rockadoodle. But Frank tells her that it's impossible. She whines some more, and we get the sense that her interest in the human world is sexual in nature. They're real. I've got power. When they touch something, they feel it. Trust me, you're better off doing that here than in our world. Back in reality, Jack goes home after leaving prison. Since he's looking for inspiration for his next drawing, he goes to Vegas and explores a comic book shop that has his comic, called Cool World. Yeah, this will make more sense later, especially given how long the cartoon world has existed. Otherwise, Jack gets home and is transported back to Cool World, right as some cute little rabbit creature is getting swindled while playing craps. We have Slash, Bash, Bob, and... Mash? <laughs> I wish. They torment Jack, since that's the default behavior of most doodles, it seems. They do, however, work for Holly, who shows up to take Jack with her. I drew you. I made you. Maybe, maybe I can erase you. <laughs> you wouldn't erase me, baby. You're too hungry for what I got. Now, this is in line with Bakshi's original concept, with the Finn Fatale wanting sex with a human anti-hero like Jack. I won't spoil the rest of the plot just yet, but that would have been a more interesting story rather than what we're about to have. Only Frank seems to be in a position to stop Holly, and right now he's meeting with his own love interest, Lonette, voiced by Candy Milo. She's probably the only character in this movie I'm okay with, since she doesn't act like Holly, and she has a good relationship with Frank despite not having sex with him. According to this world's rules, sex between a doodle and a noid, aka a human, is forbidden, mostly because of some world-breaking stuff we'll see later on. But their bond is strong enough without it that they are a couple in every other way. Why, why you always want to bust? <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> All right, where you want to go? Uh, movies? Uh... We also see Frank being more tolerable since he can be pretty sexist to Holly, even if you account for her being a femme fatale. Now keep your legs crossed and forget about the real world. Frank then gets into contact with his partner Nails, voiced by Charlie Adler, who tells him what Holly is up to. Even though she is clearly manipulating Jack, Frank treats him like a bad guy. I'm a cartoonist. I drew all this. This place exists with or without you. You believe me, right? I'm not one of your creations. No, you're not pretty enough. I mean, clearly Jack is only brought here against his own will. Not much point in hassling him when getting him home should be the priority. There's also this plot point where writing utensils, like Jack's fountain pen, 
are as lethal as drugs in Cool World? Though it isn't quite clear. All that is clear is the no sex between doodles and noids taboo, which Holly is trying to break. Anyway, Frank tells Jack to go home, and he does just that without meaning to. So, besides having no other family back home, why does Frank remain in Cool World if it's apparently easy for him to leave? Then again, how does Holly pull people into her world when you need that strange needle from the start of the movie, which is no longer in this world and is somewhere in the real world? Frank then goes back to Lonette and tells her that while he can't live without her, he can't truly be with her either. Again, this sort of relationship feels like a stand-in for mixed-race relationships and the problems that can come with them, with the only big difference being that sex between them literally means that Cool World could cease to exist. Or something like that. I don't know. So Jack is out in the desert, but he can't get Holly's voice out of his head, so he ends up back in Cool World. Frank goes to Holly's place, which I guess is headed by Sparks, when he realizes that Jack has returned. You stay away from the Noid, or you're closed for business permanently. You prance around here waving that gun around like you're some big deal. And all this time you could cross over to the real world. But you haven't got the guts. You don't have what it takes to be real. That makes you a wimp in my book. Anyway, Holly's goons take Jack to her building, where some freaky door monster lets him in. It then shoes off the other doodles because they want to watch the sex. And once again, I need to remind you that most of the time we have random cartoon characters doing random things. But they really want to see Holly having sex with a Noid, and they can apparently sense when it's about to happen. <gasps> Man is in the bedroom. <laughs> okay, seriously, what exactly kind of world is this that this is the most normal family unit present? They just seem out of place, like so many others. At least there's some real build-up and anticipation to the kinky sex that's about to follow, because this is a Ralph Bakshi film after all, but we don't actually get to see anything graphic. <laughs> Seriously, that was relatively tame. Maybe if they had gotten the hard R like they wanted, it might have gone further than this. <laughs> so yeah, since she banged Jack, she becomes annoyed herself, also played by Kim Bassinger. Meanwhile, Frank goes to apologize to Lynette before having his date with her, while Nails gets the lowdown from Sparks on what Holly just did. She might damage the entire interworld matrix or something. I don't give a doodle. -doo. Just bust her ass. For a criminal who had freaky wooden coins, you sure aren't that important, are you? Nails thinks of passing along this info to Frank, but Frank's on a date, so that could wait. We see Holly in complete shock over her new form, but it doesn't take long for her to show it off to her goons. Not sure what sort of look she's going for here, but she decides to handle Nails by sucking him into the fountain pen. Oh, because they're made of ink. I see. That's why it's deadly. Holly has Jack take her to the real world, and when they do get there, they draw the attention of a few neighbors. They're obviously curious about this strange lady who acts like a curious child. This is me. <laughs> Sparks finally tells Frank about what happened to Holly, then gets cocky about it for some reason, which leads to getting his ass handed to him. <laughs> Oh hey, Frank Sinatra Jr. He really does take after his father, huh? Guess Holly gets to compare the men in Cool World versus those in Jack's world. She's actually feeling a bit overwhelmed by this new experience, even when she gets a chance to sing and dance in front of a crowd. Jack gets upset and is thrown out of the club. When he tries to get back in... That's weird. Holly finally overcomes her jitters to start dancing while Frank decides to get out of Cool World to find her. Lynette doesn't take this well. Well, why wouldn't you want to go back? That's real to you, isn't it? This is real for me. This, with you. 
And if I want to stay with you, I gotta go back. Pretty sure that Frank would return to Cool World and settle down after bringing Holly to justice. Don't know why Lynette is unable to see that. But for Frank to go home, he needs to revisit that tragic accident that killed his mother. While that's happening, Jack and Holly continue to flicker between their doodle and Noid forms. Seems that their sexy time for before actually causes a glitch in this world. So Holly reasons that they need the spike of power to maintain their forms here. That spike was taken by another doodle who placed it on top of Union Plaza Hotel. If Holly can get it, she can remain annoyed. This is pretty different from the movie's original concept where the Holly character, Debbie Dallas, in reference to Debbie Does Dallas, would have sex with a cartoonist and have a hybrid child. That child would resent and hunt down their father, which would really mesh with the horror theme that Bakshi wanted. That story would greatly justify the sort of world we have, instead of being a dumping ground for random cartoon characters from old cartoon studios. Jack is skeptical about finding the spike, and Holly responds by kicking him out. Frank arrives in the real world and in Jack's house, leading to an argument. Why don't you shoot me, goddammit? Shoot me, Harris. Don't, don't shoot push me. Don't push me. You just couldn't take a piece of good advice, could you? No, Jack, you had to listen to your Johnson. Do your girl and your Johnson. Jack tells Frank about what Holly is planning to do, so they set out to stop her. During their travels, they talk about what Dr. Whiskers did to bring Frank to their world, and then we learn that he actually went into the real world with the spike of power. But... Sure, I touched him, but I couldn't hold it. No one can! Is the spike just there for everyone to make dick jokes? But before Holly can ink him, Frank and Jack arrive. They give chase through the hotel, and reality is already starting to change given previous exposure to Cool World. Frank seems to corner her, but she pushes him down. Oh my god. Very sad. Anyway. Holly reaches the spike while Jack realizes that this is his one chance to do something right. He uses his new doodle powers to catch up with Holly at the top of the hotel. But he's too late. She picks up the spike and all hell breaks loose. Literally. <laughs> The nightmare really is reality! Jack gets to her and is transformed into... a superhero. Okay. Leading to a climactic battle between Super Jack and the Evil Toons. All the while, people are getting turned into doodles or are getting attacked by them. And this is probably the one scene in the movie that's genuinely entertaining. For once, random chaos actually fits with the plot. Holly tries one last time to get Jack on her side, but he decides against it and goes to plug the hole. <coughs> Finally, the most cartoonish thing that happened to her. Anyway, all the tunes return to Cool World. Jack and Holly should be fine because of the Spike's power or whatever. Not so much for Frank. Nails takes him back to Cool World to reunite with Lonette. She's of course sad, as to be expected. Well, what happens to Noids who traffic in the Cool World, Nails? When they get killed by a doodle, they become a doodle themselves. What? Hot dog. Dig it. Dig me. So, at what point was this ever hinted at? Seriously, I could maybe understand if there was some foreshadowing, like maybe that one frame of Cartoon Frank from the start of the movie, but there really wasn't anything to imply that people could be reborn as doodles. All this just to have a happy ending between Frank and Lynette, and, well, they're the closest to being the most likable characters in this movie, so... Okay. As for the others... Be deliriously happy, honey -poo. <laughs> That's a dick. So, was this movie cool? No, not really. If anything, the only thing cool about this movie was the art and animation. Seriously, the Nightmare World would have been amazing, but it was such an ill fit with the story. Half of the residents feel out of place, while the other half rarely have opportunities to show what makes this place cool. It might have even helped the story more since Jack really thought this world was his, 
but that was just a means to have him lust over someone forbidden. The romance between Frank and Lynette was fine, I just think they could have done more with Frank since his trauma of his mother's death was barely touched on. I guess the constant revisions and executive meddling ruined what could have been an interesting Ralph Bakshi movie. Instead, we have a directionless story, possible infighting between director and producer, and an underwhelming use of Cool World itself. So the movie bombed both critically and financially, rightfully so, but it did garner a cult following because its animation is that good. At least it's not boring, but that could lead to being annoyed, which isn't ideal either. So if you are able to look past the random chaos, maybe there's something you can get out of this cool world. I'm the Media Hunter. Media is my prey, and reviewing them my way.